We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions, which I trailed earlier, on justice and the law officers. Our first question from Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government how many fire stations have been supplied with PET oxygen masks by the organisation Smokey Paws. Minister Ashton. Uh, Smokey Paws is to be commended for its work in raising awareness of the safety of pets in fires and in fundraising to provide the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service with specifically designed oxygen masks. 251 of these pet oxygen kits have already been handed over to stations across Scotland, with another 25 in the process of being distributed to SFRS local senior officer areas. These 276 kits have been supplied to the fire service through donations made by the Smoky Paws charity by individual members of the public, firefighters, animal charities, dog walking groups and a range of companies, uh, including several veterinary practices. Thank you. Tom Arthur. I thank the Minister for her response and updating Parliament. My constituent, Ron Ewing, was at the forefront of the Smoky Paws campaign in Scotland, uh, coordinating uh, the operation of Smoky Paws in Scotland, co-coordinating it, visiting countless fire stations the length and breadth of Scotland to hand over the pet oxygen mask kits. He was also an enthusiastic member of the CPG on Accident and Prevention and Awareness, convened by my colleague Claire Adamson, as well as a former chair of Johnston Community Council. He was also a friend, and he is in many respects responsible more than anyone else for the prevalence of the oxygen pet oxygen kits across Scotland today. Sadly, Ron passed away during the summer recess after a short illness. Does the Minister agree with me that Ron's legacy is one that his wife, Carol, his family, friends and community can be proud of? Minister. I, I certainly would. And uh, my thoughts are with Ron's family and friends at this time for their sad loss. Uh, Ron clearly was the driving force in introducing these kits to the SFRS and he spent a large part of his time supporting their delivery, travelling the length and breadth of Scotland. And his passion and his dedication will be remembered and his legacy will continue as Scottish firefighters use the oxygen therapy kits in their line of duty. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the percentage change has been in the number of recorded crimes in North Ayrshire over the, past, over the last decade and how this compares with the national figure. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. The latest national statistics show the number of crimes recorded in North Ayrshire fell by 36% between 2009-10 and 2018-19. This represents a reduction of just over 3,300 crimes. Uh, over the same period, recorded crime fell 27% across the whole of Scotland. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee has criticised the UK Government's ability to tackle organised crime, including human and drugs trafficking, drug dealing and cyber crime, and suggests it looks to Scotland for answers. How is organised crime being tackled in North Ayrshire and across Scotland, and to what extent is this reducing crime uh, in our communities? Cabinet Secretary. Important point that uh, Kenneth Gibson uh, raises. He'll probably know that I chair the serious organised crime <coughs> task force and partners on that serious organised crime task force uh, of which Lord Advocate also uh, attends uh, continues to take forward a range of activity to reduce the harm caused by serious organised crime in North Ayrshire and of course across Scotland. Um, this effort is supported by the state of the art facilities at the Scottish Crime Campus in Garkosh and the collaborative approaches it engenders uh, which law enforcement colleagues elsewhere across the United Kingdom look at with great uh, envy. In fact, as the evidence in July this year to the PAC inquiry into serious and organised crime at Westminster, the Chief Constable of Merseyside Police said that, and I quote, there are a lot of good things happening in Scotland that we should keep a very close eye on. So from a Scottish Government perspective, we're very keen to, of course, continue that effort uh, against uh, serious organised crime, uh, human trafficking, which uh, Kenneth Gibson mentions, and where we can share information, of course we routinely do, but where we can share good practice uh, with forces and other partners across the United Kingdom. Uh, we're always happy to do so. Liam Kerr, to be followed by James Kerr. Thank you, Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, not only has violent crime risen for the fourth year in a row to the highest level in seven years, but clear-up rates for violent crime has now dropped to the lowest level in eight years. More robberies, more serious assaults, and fewer of the perpetrators being brought to justice. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any answers to that? Because it doesn't seem so. 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it's easy for anybody, particularly Liam Kerr, to pick out any statistic in any given year. But the longer-term trend is what you want to look at. Longer-term trend shows that violent crime has reduced drastically, 43%. Uh, over the last decade, recorded crime fallen by almost a half over the last decade. Let's contrast that with the Conservatives over the last decade. Uh, of course, you're more likely to be a victim of crime if you're an adult under Tory-run England and Wales. Uh, that's probably because they've cut 20,000 officers, yeah. where we've, of course, increased officers by over 1,000. So I'll take no lectures off Liam Kerr and the Conservatives on how we have to deal uh, with crime, with law and order in Scotland. And of course, uh, uh, I would say to him, uh, if he is serious about tackling this issue, he should look at the underlying causes of why some of that crime, uh, violent crime, has risen in the year. We know that, for example, part of that is to do with operational uh, reasons uh, in terms of uh, stop and searches for drug possession. So we are serious about uh, reducing crime. That's why we have such a good track record over the last decade and just over a decade. Uh, and it's something that Liam Kern and Conservative Party could learn from. James Kelly. One of the areas that's causing concern in terms of the recent statistics is the rise in crimes of a sexual nature, which can up by 8% and is at the highest level since 1971. And in local areas like Glasgow, where it's gone up by 9%, and South Lanarkshire, where it's gone up by 20%, uh, that has caused real anxiety. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does he recognise the serious issue and the challenge presented by the rise in crimes of a sexual nature and what specifically the government are going to do to tackle this issue. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank James Kelly for uh, that question, a very serious uh, subject and, and, a, and a really important question to ask and, and I appreciate the tone in which uh, he asked it as well. Uh, some not too different to what I said to Liam Kelly in respect to it's important that we look at long-term trends. The long-term trend over the last eight years has seen a rise in sexual offences. So uh, there's a number of reasons underlying that. Uh, just a few examples and a few reasons I should say, of the underlying uh, reasons for those that growth in, in sexual offending. Uh, one is we know that a number of those cases uh, are historic sexual offences, so we would hope that that would mean that people have more confidence to, to report. Uh, we know that uh, from having talked uh, to a number of victims organisations and so on and so forth, there's more we can clearly do around that confidence, but there is a greater confidence we feel to report. Uh, more worryingly, uh, I would say uh, we've seen the rise in the use of technology uh, for sexual offences and sexual crimes, uh, cyber-enabled uh, sexual offences, and even more worryingly, perhaps, than that, uh, is, is, is the number of young people on young people offences that we see of a sexual nature. And on that front, in order to answer James Kelly's question direct, that Dr Catherine Dyer has done an incredible piece of work looking at that particular element. Uh, I think her report and her final report is due uh, very shortly uh, with us, and of course I'll update James Kelly uh, and the Parliament in due course once we have that report. Thank you. Question number three, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government how many convictions for vicarious liability have been made under provisions in the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, up to 2017-18, uh, the latest date for which information is available, there have been four prosecutions involving relevant charges brought under the Section 18A of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 and those have resulted in two convictions. One person was convicted of four charges in 2014-15, and another person was convicted of two charges in 2015-16. Alison Jones. Thank you. A vicarious liability was presented by the Scottish Government in 2012 as a strong response to raptor persecution, and civil society welcomed the provision and had high expectations that it would be effective. However, it's clearly the case that there's no indication that raptor persecution rates have been positively affected um, and as the cabinet secretary has said there have been very few convictions why have there not been more and does the cabinet secretary agree that the time is right for an urgent review thank you cabinet secretary what i said alison johnson again it's an incredibly important uh, question uh, that she asks in terms of why there's only been uh, two convictions uh, for vicarious liability since 2011. There's a number of reasons uh, why it may not be appropriate to pursue, pursue a charge of vicarious liability. For example, in common with other crimes, uh, there are evidentiary thresholds that must be met before a case can be brought. Uh, COPFS must also consider whether it would be in the public interest to pursue a conviction. She will, of course, uh, be aware uh, of the recent bill uh, that was introduced, uh, the Animal and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Bill, uh, that while that doesn't create new offences, uh, it will uh, look to increase the maximum fine and prison term 
that a court can impose on those found guilty of vicarious liability. In terms of uh, raptor uh, persecution, which she mentioned, uh, I think the member will be aware that we established an independent group to examine how we can pursue uh, that grouse moor management is sustainable and compliant with the law. Uh, that review that's led by Professor uh, Werity is due to report in the coming weeks. And again, I'll ensure that the appropriate minister keeps uh, Alison Johnson updated on that progress. Claudia Beamish. Officer, um, landowners, of course, have a direct responsibility for what happens on their land. With only two convictions for vicarious liability, can the Cabinet Secretary clarify if it is not, or it is indeed, legally necessary for there to have been a charge and successful prosecution of the perpetrator of a crime against our wildlife in order for a vicarious liability charge to proceed if the evidence of the crime is compelling? Again, maybe I can uh, get more detail to Claudia Beamish about uh, the, the exact uh, dependencies uh, of the law, but it would be, uh, as I said to my question to Alison Johnson, uh, there is a range of factors that have to be considered uh, in terms of pursuing a, a charge of vicarious liability. As I said, evidentiary thresholds uh, about a case being brought, but also it's for, it's for the Crown Office and Procurator for Fiscal Service to consider whether it would be in the public interest to pursue a conviction, that is for them. Uh, and I know uh, she, she is saying, I think, from, from, from her position that uh, it, it often is, but that is not something as Justice Secretary uh, I can interfere in. Uh, that decision rightly lies uh, with the Crown. But uh, I take the points that Alison Johnson has made, I take the point that Cla Claudia Beamish uh, has made, and I will uh, uh, certainly uh, see if I can get more detail on the specific uh, question that Claudia Beamish asked and, and write to her more detail. Thank you. Question for Rudy Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to protect families who have been affected by domestic abuse. Minister Ashton. The Children's Scotland Bill was introduced on the 2nd of September and a key aim of the bill is to further protect victims of domestic abuse and their children in family courts. In particular, the bill restricts the personal conduct of a case in proceedings uh, involving vulnerable witnesses ensures that special measures to protect vulnerable parties are available in child welfare hearings and establishes a register of child welfare reporters which will ensure reporters are appropriately trained in domestic abuse. Uh, the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act of 2018 creates a specific event of domestic abuse and it reflects that children are harmed by domestic abuse by creating a statutory aggravation in relation to children and enabling the court to use a non-harassment order to protect children as well as the adult victim in the offence. The, the Minister acknowledges the harm done to children who are subject to domestic abuse, whether they have directly witnessed it or not. But yet the civil courts continue to give parental rights and access to abusive parents. The abuser often continues to control and abuse their victim using that right. Will the Scottish Government legislate to ensure that an abusive parent no long, will no longer be granted these rights? Will they ensure that no victim of domestic abuse is faced with the horrifying choice of sending their children into an unsafe situation or they themselves facing arrest and jail for contempt of court? Minister. Um, I thank Rhoda Grant for raising this, what is a really uh, serious issue. And we are aware that some perpetrators of domestic abuse may seek to lodge repeated court cases uh, regarding contact and residence in order to continue uh, the domestic abuse. So we propose to make regulations under section 102 of the Court Reform Scotland Act 2014 in relation to vexatious uh, behaviour in contact and residence cases. And this will allow the Court of Session, the Sheriff Court or the Sheriff Appeal Court to make an order in relation to a person who has behaved in a vexatious manner. But there are also a number of provisions contained in the Children's Scotland Bill um, which aim to put the child at the centre and also to protect uh, uh, victims of domestic abuse and their families. Thank you. Question five, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact a presumption against short sentences will have on female offenders in Scotland. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. National statistics show that around 90% of custodial sentences for women are for 12 months or less. Many of these women will have experienced abuse, mental health or addiction problems, or indeed a combination of all three at some point uh, in their lives. Short prison sentences do little to rehabilitate people or reduce their likelihood of reoffending. And we know that they can disrupt families and adversely affect employment opportunities 
and stable housing, all of which evidence shows support desistance from offending. The presumption is not a ban, and decisions about sentencing are a matter for the independent court. Uh, however, the extended presumption is intended to help enable a further shift to community-based interventions where appropriate and is expected to positively impact on women in the justice system. Impact will be monitored closely, uh, including in relation to the impact uh, on the female population. Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, a recent um, report um, from the Ministry of Justice um, called the Economic and Social Costs of Reoffending Analytical Reports showed that there was a societal cost of £18 billion a year in the UK. Given this, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Scottish Conservatives in this chamber, as well as the new Government Justice Minister, Robert Buckland, should get behind this, this um, project and get beh behind the presumption against short sentences to the benefit of the whole of society? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I would, I would agree with that uh, sentiment. I've often said that my approach uh, to justice and evidence-based approach, that was clearly also the approach that was being taken in terms of short sentences by uh, Robert Buckland's predecessor, David Gawke, uh, and indeed his junior minister, uh, Minister for Prisons at the time, uh, Rory Stewart, who I know was thought of well uh, in terms of some of the members of the Conservative benches. And David Gawke, in his last speech as UK Justice Secretary, stated, and I quote, that whether through prison community sentences or fines, offenders must face justice. And justice works best when punishment and rehabilitation are balanced and the cycle of crime is broken. Let me be clear. I don't want to see softer justice. I want to deliver smarter justice where offenders serve sentences that punish, but also make them less likely to reoffend. end quote. And because we know the economic and social cost of reoffending is significant, and we know from evidence that short custodial sentences are not as effective and not effective at rehabilitation. The extended presumption against short sentences is not a silver bullet, of course, but it is an important reform as part of an evidence-led progressive approach to reducing offending. Lee MacArthur. According to HMIPS, the number of women held in custody on 31st of March 2019 uh, was 380, as it was at the same time in 2018. Given the new female custodial estate is due to accommodate 230 places, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary offer uh, that not only will the new prison and community custody units be completed in 2020, as promised, but that the female prisoner numbers will be in line with capacity at that stage? Well, Lee MacArthur does uh, raise uh, an important uh, point. Now, the hope is that, of course, the presumption against short sentences has an impact in reducing uh, that female uh, custodial uh, population. Uh, but also, he might well be aware that at the moment, as things stand, there is also capacity in other prisons uh, to hold females. That is not the position that we want. We want uh, our new CCUs uh, plus the new national facility to be able to hold a female custodial estate. But, of course, there are... Uh, other places where capacity would be found if needed. But that is not the, that is not the intention. The intention is that hopefully PASS reduces the number of women in our female custodial uh, state uh, and, and, uh, uh, and indeed uh, the, the CCUs uh, and, and the new national facility holds uh, will, 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 be, will be fine in terms of capacity. But uh, if we need uh, to look at other uh, parts of the prison estate uh, as we currently do, uh, to hold females, then of course uh, there is that capacity uh, should it be required. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In its recent uh, report, Audit Scotland suggested that the presumption would reduce the prison population by just 200. Given that we are 5% over capacity, what other measures is the Cabinet Secretary considering to either reduce the prison population or indeed increase capacity? Well, I, I don't want to do the latter. If I can give the, the, the member that reassurance, I don't want to increased capacity. I don't want to be uh, a minister who is uh, building additional uh, prisons. Of course, uh, new prisons to replace the ones that were closing down, but not additional prisons. Uh, the answer very much lies in the former, uh, the first part of his question, uh, which is how do we reduce uh, the numbers that are coming in? So yes, the presumption he's right will have uh, an impact, and that impact maybe will be around two to three hundred. Uh, where I'm really keen, and I know Daniel, Daniel Johnson has uh, an interest in this, what I'm really keen to do is tackle the population that is in remand in our prisons, and I think bail supervision will be a large part of that. Uh, the management of offenders uh, provisions, some of them will commence uh, later this month in just a, a few days' uh, time, actually, uh, and then we can look further at some more bail supervision measures. So tackling remand will certainly be a part of that. Uh, investing in community justice alternatives so that co sheriffs have confidence in those measures will be a part of it. But there is not, as Daniel Johnson's question alludes to, 
one silver bullet, one panacea that will help us with that. It will have to be a whole range of measures uh, for which, of course, uh, we are uh, absolutely determined to take a very evidence-led and progressive approach. Question six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, and I refer to my register of interest as a member of Unite the Union to ask the Scottish Government to what extent the Crown Office and Procurator for Fiscal Service works with the University of Glasgow's Forensic Toxicology Service when responding to drug deaths. Lord Advocate James Wolfe. I'm grateful to Monica Lennon for that question. Um, all sudden, unexpected and suspicious deaths in Scotland are reported to the Crown. Where the death may be drug-related, the Crown instructs toxicological analysis of samples obtained at post-mortem examination. Glasgow University currently provides this service under contract with COPFS for deaths in the east and west of Scotland, with NHS Grampian providing a service for the north of Scotland. In cases of this sort, toxicological analysis may be essential in order to establish the cause of death. Monica Lennon. Thank you for that answer. When we have a drug death emergency, there should be no disruption to a vital service, which does deal with 90% of all cases of toxicological analysis. Can I ask the Lord Advocate, can he guarantee that there will be no gap in provision or knock-on delays of the current contract with Glasgow University ceases early next year? Lord Advocate. Um, it's perhaps uh, important that I put the uh, current situation um, with that contract in, in, the, in its context. Um, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is engaged in a project which aims to improve across the board in the provision of pathology, mortuary and toxicology services, quality of service delivery, affordability, transparency and value for money. Um, in the course of negotiation with Glasgow University in that context, the university intimated that it does not wish to continue to provide toxicology services in the longer term. Um, the Crown has had constructive discussions with an alternative provider with a view to transfer of this work from Glasgow University and COPFS anticipates that assuming these discussions reach a satisfactory conclusion, staff will have the option to transfer to the new provider. Uh, COPFS is working with the alternative provider on a full assessment of future service requirements uh, uh, as well as the management of transition. Um, no contract is yet in place, so I can't, I'm afraid, give, uh, uh, say more at this stage. But meantime, I'm pleased to be able to say that Glasgow University has confirmed this week that it's willing in principle to extend the toxicology contract to the end of September 2020, with a view to the work uh, transferring thereafter to an alternative provider. Um, this will help to minimize disruption to this essential service and will, I hope, give reassurance to the uh, staff involved. I should like to make clear the significant contribution which the pathologists and toxicologists at Glasgow University and elsewhere make to the investigation and prosecution of crime and the investigation of deaths and the value which I attach to that work. And um, uh, senior Crown Office officials met with those staff last week to discuss their concerns and to set out uh, next steps. Thank you. And Sandra Hoyt. Thank you very much, President Officer. It's very sad to have confirmed uh, what I already knew from a letter uh, from the university in meeting with the, the staff there as well. But also in the letter I received from the Crown Office, it mentions National Forensic and Non-Forensic Pathology Service for Scotland, a creation of. Can I ask then if this new provider is the creation of National Forensic and Non-Forensic Pathology Service for Scotland and will it be based in Scotland? Advocate. Um, thanks, Sandra White, for that uh, question. Um, the work that the Crown Office is engaged in in relation to these services um, has the long-term ambition of establishing a national forensic and non-forensic pathology service for Scotland with centres of excellence for relevant specialisms in different uh, locations. So, for example, the service has made progress on the establishment of a national neuropathology service, which will be provided by NHS uh, Lothian. Um, it's, we have a strong interest in retaining um, these services and the relevant skills uh, in Scotland and um, Crown, of Crown Office of Procurator Fiscal Service um, in the context of the work that I've described um, would uh, hope to um, retain the, that work in Scotland. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is 
consideration of business motion 19218 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Can I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Thank you very much. And no member wishes to speak on this motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 19218 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes, yes we are agreed. Thank you.